Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending today. Uh, my name is Greg Butler. I am the vice president of the Black Inclusion Group, as well as a customer success manager here in Talent Solutions. Uh, and thank you all for joining me for investing in money management with our very own Ario Eckstein and New York Jets superstar, Kelvin Beecham. Let's give him a round of applause. So in collaboration with the Black Inclusion Group and the LinkedIn Speaker Series, I'm very excited that this is our first New York City Black History Month. We're kicking off in New York City. Uh, so I do want to give a few shouts out before we get started. Uh, first and foremost, obvious shout out to the LinkedIn Speaker Series staff on hand, along with the LinkedIn editorial team who've been working with Kelvin and the Black Inclusion Group over the last few months. A uh, quick round of applause for them. Secondly, a very, very big, pun intended, shout out to Ezra Zimbler and Kristen Kimball, our two leads for each side of the, the business, and we're looking to uh, thank them for bringing Kelvin and Ariel together today. Round of applause for them. And lastly, for you all in attendance, thank you guys for showing up on the stream via Facebook, Kelvin's page, via our YouTube, LinkedIn, Speaker Series page, as well as on site. Uh, and we're looking to put together a very, very good chat today. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, investing in money management is our main topic of discussion. Uh, we're going to ask that you guys post to LinkedIn via LinkedIn speaker series hashtag, via the LinkedIn big hashtag, as well as tag Kelvin at Kelvin Beecham Jr. on all of your posts that you have. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our special guest today, Vice President of Global Clients for LinkedIn Talent Solutions, Ario Eckstein. You did a great job there, except you got one thing wrong. What's that? He's our special guest, okay? <laughs> Kelvin's our special guest. Uh, thanks, thanks to everybody for coming, and thanks to all the teams who are working so hard to, uh, to put this together in a really quality event. Um, and, and so, as, as Greg said, uh, Black History Month is a really important month um, for us to really think about um, the experience of the African American community, not just in the history, not just in the past, but going forward, right? And that includes money management, includes career management, includes investing. Uh, and continuing to be successful. Um, so I want to thank uh, the Black Inclusion Group to, uh, for sponsoring this and putting this together and bringing us all together. Um, and so what we're going to do is I'm just going to quickly introduce Kelvin, and then uh, nobody speaks better about Kelvin than Kelvin. So I'm going to have him come up and, and talk, he'll, he'll talk a little bit about his voyage and, and the journey that he's making both as a professional athlete and as an investor and a mentor and a mentee to a number of people. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have a little bit of a chat up here. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A, so please bring your questions. So most of you know Kelvin was a star athlete at Southern Methodist University. Not only was he a great athlete, but he was then you know, also a great student and was able to then, was asked to deliver the commencement address at the, uh, at the School of Education there. So again, always seeking to be a well-rounded individual, not just purely an athlete. Um, the second is he's been a star with the New York Jets for several years. And so we were talking about when we're going to get the Jets in the Super Bowl. And he was giving me his perspective of the work that they're going to do to, to uh, continue to, to strive for excellence. Um, but also, he's an investor, as a personal investor, and also uh, investing with a company called Next Play Capital. And so um, you know, controlling his own destiny, taking his future into his own hands, both pre and, and, and for the day when he may no longer be an active athlete, is critical. Right? And so I think it's something for us to all think about. You know, how do we manage our own destiny? Right? That's professional, educational, financial. And so with that, I'm going to ask Kelvin to come up and uh, talk to him, talk, talk a little bit about his journey, and then we'll do a little bit of a fireside chat. OK, there you go, man. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, whatever day this is, I don't know what day it is, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> I flew in last night and fly out tonight, so I'm just thankful for everybody uh, that showed up today. Uh, look, Kelvin, that's what they call me back in the country. I'm from a little country town called Mahia, Texas, about an hour and a half south of Dallas. Um, 7,500 people. There are more cattle in my hometown than there are people, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, went off to SMU, um, and before I got there, uh, my parents gave me some simple instructions. 
we're not going to pay for college. I don't know how you're going to get there. I don't know how you're going to pay for it, but you're going to college. Uh, and my dad's words of advice were, as long as you go farther than I do, I'd be happy. So in many instances, I've accomplished what my dad asked me to accomplish. I accomplished what my mom asked me to accomplish, to go to college. Um, and while I was at college, I was able to participate uh, on the football team. I got a full ride to play football there. Uh, started 52 consecutive games as a starting left tackle um, for the SMU Mustangs. Pony up for all those who are streaming in live right now. <laughs> Uh, but served in a number of different capacities while I was at SMU. Uh, served as a student representative to the Board of Trustees. I was a student athlete body uh, president um, for a couple years. Also served at the Conference USA level, and then also served uh, the national, the NCAA, uh, as a SAC representative. So was pretty active while I was on campus. Um, and then the draft came. Um, I am three picks away from Mr. Irrelevant. So if any of you who follow the draft, uh, there are a number of picks that happened in an NFL draft, and I was three picks away uh, from being the last person selected in that draft. I was the last offensive lineman selected in that draft. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm still kicking, man, <laughs> to be honest with you. And I'm having a great time. Um, you know, I was, uh, got drafted to Pittsburgh. Uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers was there for four years. Uh, blew my knee out in 2015, ACL, MCL, and meniscus. Uh, I am great. I can jump. I can run. I can play with my daughter, play with my kids, play with my son now. Got a, a three-year-old little girl and a two-month-old little boy, so can't wait to get back to him tonight. You know, when you're a man, you get that boy, you just you feel like you've accomplished something. So I finally got my son, <laughs> so I feel like I've accomplished something. And um, blew my knee out, um, went to Jacksonville for a year, um, was there, had a great time there. Um, Season didn't go as well as I would like for it to go, and then signed a three-year deal with the New York Jets. And uh, here for a while, and want to be here for a while. Um, and like some of the salespeople told me, if you do your job, you get to stay. So I got to, <laughs> I got to do my job so I can stay around a little longer. But um, my journey as an investor um, and as a philanthropist, it all started from my childhood. Uh, for me, my mother loved to cook. Uh, you know, anybody from Texas, you know, uh, we love to cook down in the South. And any of y'all want to come down to the South, I take good care of y'all, good Southern hospitality. Uh, but my, my mother loved to cook, so I really got into wanting to feed people. I did that in college. I took it to a whole nother level when I got to the National Football League. I uh, started working with uh, World Vision, Bread for the World, Feeding America, and those are still partners of mine. And then as I started to develop and see some of the things that were happening in our society, I started to really gravitate to, to STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And if you add the arts, for those who are artsy, uh, it's STEAM. Um, and I've really spent a lot of time in that particular space over the last four years. Um, in that, I've really uh, started to, to find my own niche um, and where I can really serve the community and where I can really serve young people. So I've really spent a lot of time there. And then investing started to, to take hold. Startups, looking at the way startups are run, uh, looking at the holes in the pipeline that we currently have within the startup community, and then where I could play at. Uh, so I've started to invest, started to invest in, in young people, starting to invest in companies, and the areas that I like to look at, well, I think me and uh, Ariel will talk about those as, uh, as we get going, but I've really enjoyed that space. Uh, and as an African-American athlete, um, sometimes we're stereotyped as um, jocks. You know, we really don't know anything about anything, but. You know, for me, I've always wanted to defy that stereotype. Um, right now, I'm in a box. I hate being in a box uh, because I've never liked being in a box. You know, as a left tackle, I'm the shortest and smallest left tackle in the National Football League. Um, and that says a lot about how big some of the guys are in the National Football League. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, for us, we've always, you know, athletes are sometimes put in a box. And for me, I've always tried to find a way to get myself outside of the box, get myself outside of comfort zones, and for me, you know, you look at the corporate sector right now, I think we have to find ways to get out of, out of, out of our corporate zone, I mean, out of our comfort zone uh, to better equip our corporations as we move forward. So with that, I'm going to bring Ariel back up, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So if you're the shortest and smallest left tackle in the NFL, you're saying that's not a place for me. Not a place for you. <laughs> Uh, you'd probably be a good kicker. I mean, uh, <laughs> you got the size for it, you know. Uh, you know, if you've got leg strength. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Um, kick it out the back of the end zone, they pay you good money. You've done, he's done this before. So um, I'm going to set the table 
with a couple of just data points, right? Uh, we linked in, we, we love data. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to actually to kind of frame um, some of the challenges facing minority founders mm -hmm. and minority investors in, in the world today. Perfect. And then what I'd love to do with this is get your thoughts on some of this, yep. right? So just to so, you know, kind of set a common, a, common, a common knowledge set here, I got a couple, a couple of data points here, which is uh, half of VC firms say they have a pro programs to diversify their workforce, but only 10% of firms Right, 10% of the firms reported they have actually uh, set and defined programs to develop, recruit, hire, promote, and mentor diverse employees. Right, CB Insights says only 1% of VC-backed startups have African American founders. Right, 12% of founders are Asian, and 87% are white. Right, and Forbes reports that there are only four African American CEOs at the helm of Fortune 100 companies. Well, I'm sorry, Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And so there's work to do, right? There's work to do. Um, at LinkedIn, um, there's work to do, mm -hmm. right? We, uh, we started many years ago a diversity initiative that was initially focused on women, just mm -hmm. to give you a perspective. And then in the last couple of years, have really started to try to lean in to address our underrepresented minorities, African Americans, people of Hispanic descent. And, uh, you know, we're happy that we have that, but we acknowledge there's work to do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so um, that's one of the reasons why we're so excited to have, mm -hmm. to have you here, because of the dual roles that you play, Correct. right? Not just as an athlete, but as an investor, as a mentor, and as a philanthropist. Yeah. So I'm gonna kick off, I'm gonna kick off. So I think what everybody is dying to know right now mm -hmm. is what did you think of the Super Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, And they're gonna get harder, the question is gonna get That's fine, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, but to be honest, which I didn't start watching the Super Bowl until uh, the second quarter with four minutes left. I actually went to church and uh, I fasted and prayed for about an hour because I needed to unwind. It's been a while since I've been in church like mm -hmm. I needed to. So I bypassed the first quarter and a half and then uh, saw the last, uh, you know, the halftime show. I don't know what, what you thought about it, but uh, I watched it. Um, <laughs> I thought Justin Bieber was excellent. <laughs> But I sat, I sat and watched it um, and then really enjoyed the second half of the game. You mm -hmm. know, um, uh, I know we've got too many Jets personnel here, but I had about five little pecan pie tarts while, while I was uh, – well, I, I, I'm from the country. I love pecan pie. Love pecan pie. So I um, had a couple of those and watched the second half. But it was a good game. It was a good game. It was a hard-fought game. You know, you knew uh, Philadelphia really starts the game fast and, you, you know, started the game fast like they've done all year. Um, but, you know, anytime you play uh, New England and, and play Tom Brady, you know that uh, you got to keep your foot on the gas for, for four quarters, and they found a way to do that. Well, I'm just excited about next year when we see the Jets in the Super Bowl. We've got a lot of work to do. Okay. We're going to hold you to that. <laughs> so we're going we're to transition and, and start talking a little bit about um, your experience outside of the athletic arena, mm -hmm. right? And so how did you get started? Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started and, and what kind of triggered you and got you focused mm -hmm. on investment opportunities and, and the, the non-sporting business world. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, at, um, I was in Pittsburgh at the time. I was thinking about going to get an MBA from Carnegie Mellon there in Pittsburgh and um, started to, you know, use my network to think of, the, you know, ask if this is a, the right thing to do at the time and um, went to at and I have a good friend over there, uh, John Donovan. Um, who serves as the AT&T uh, AT CEO of communications. That's a good friend, yeah. <laughs> and sat him down and was kind of telling him my life story and what I was wanting to accomplish. And he said, bypass the MBA. And I will kind of teach you, teach you the ropes and, and mentor you. And um, you got my personal sale. Call me when you need anything. And, and let's think about the way that you're pursuing business differently. Um, so that was kind of the kickoff. And then the Super Bowl happened out in San Francisco uh, between the, the Broncos and the Panthers and the NFLPA. Um, got a number of players together and took us on tech tours. Uh, we got to see the, the back end of Facebook and Oculus and Uber uh, and Twitter and got to see, you know, the tech ecosystem uh, from a different light. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, went to Jacksonville, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and got in a fund called Next Play Capital. Uh, Next Play Capital for me is, is showing what athletes have the power to do. Um, Next Play was really started by a guy named Ronnie Lott. Um, and if you know anything about football, you know anything about the San Francisco 49ers, uh, him and, and Joe Montana were those guys that were athletes that kind of got into the tech scene um, early on. And uh, got into Next Play Capital, um, finished the year off in Jacksonville, and then came here to New York 
And for me, that's when the network really blew up. I had a guy by the name of Mark Garrison uh, who introduced me to a number of people. One of the first people he introduced me to when I got to New York was Gary V. And I know everybody knows that name. Um, but one of the first people he introduced me to here. Um, and then a, a guy by the name of Nat Turner over at Flatiron Health. Um, it's really just exposed me to the New York ecosystem. And for me, that's kind of been my lineage or, or my direction and, and kind of start uh, for, for how I look at investments and the people that I'm able to pull on um, as I'm looking at investments. So uh, investments, let's talk a little bit about investments because we were talking about it before, before y'all came in. And uh, you know, you've been here a few minutes and I'm starting to say y'all. Really? <laughs> in Manhattan, right? Okay. Talk about influential. Um, <laughs> and, and so uh, we talked about, I guess I'll ask you two questions. Mm -hmm. One is, what do you look for when you're, when you're making investments on your behalf or with NextPlay? And then secondly, I wanted to ask you about some of the, the investments that you made that you're yep. excited about. Yep. So I'm just an investor at NextPlay. I don't work there. I work mm -hmm. for them. So I'm just an investor at NextPlay. But personally, uh, what I look for is I look for businesses that are not sexy, you know, um, you know, right now, most athletes are looking at very consumer-focused consumer, consumer focused facing businesses. You know, what you're wearing, uh, who's looking at you, Snapchat, all those different things, which is great. But for me, I want to look beyond that curtain, pull that curtain back. And what are some of the, the hot technical things that are going on within the tech, uh, within the, the, the tech ecosystem that I can gravitate to? Um, so I've really kind of pushed away uh, the consumer-focused type of companies and kind of got to the high tech, the deep tech. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's robotics and drones. I, I love drones to death. You know, one of my favorite companies is DJI, and I'm going to get to see them next week. So really excited about that particular company uh, and that particular industry. Um, and then for me, I'm from the country. I told you I, I'm from the country. I love cattle. Um, so ag tech, agriculture technology is a space that I've really spent a lot of time um, developing over the, over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, drones, ag tech, and uh, what about the, the investment you just made that you were telling me about that you're yep. excited about? So the latest one that I just made is a company called BotKeeper. Uh, it's robots for um, accounting. Uh, so most people right now... You just uh, made our finance department Oh, yeah. Really nervous. What are they at? What are they at? What are they at? What are they at? What are they in here? They're in California. They're in California. Yeah. <laughs> California, y'all streaming live. BotKeeper, okay. check them out. Uh -huh. um, uh, but what they do, most firms or, or, or most entities right now, they have one person for every uh, six companies. What uh, BotKeeper has been able to do is do one person for every 60 companies. Uh, the former CFO of Microsoft is an investor. Uh, Ignition Partners um, led the round, mm -hmm. um, got in on the round, so excited about uh, that particular investment. That was kind of my first, first one of the year, and I still have about um, six more to go this year. I'm sorry, you said you're going to make six more investments mm -hmm. this year? And, and how do you arrive at that number? How do you set those goals? Um, you know, for me in football, we always have metrics and, and goals that we, that we are working to attain. Um, I have a great support system. My financial advisor would actually meet me in Arizona tomorrow. Um, and we're going to be working on my allocations, my follow-on strategy, my portfolio structure for what we have for this particular year. Um, and that's the number that, that we've settled on this year. So um, once I get my allocation from him and what we decide upon, mm -hmm. um, all right, this is what you have for the year. Uh, how many do you want to make? Six is kind of the number, the minimum mm -hmm. that I want to make this year. Um, and then, you know, continue to follow on with some of the investments I made this past year. And will they be, so will they be in those areas mm -hmm. that you're most interested in? The drone, you know, the drone device and the, uh, the ag tech primarily? Yes, or will you look um, so right now I'm looking at an ag tech fund uh, because, you know, ag tech is, is a very um, green uh, space right now as, as far as just it's not mature yet. Um, there's still some things that need to develop. Um, so looking at a fund right now to really get some exposure to an ag tech fund. So doing some research uh, along those lines. Got it. Got it. Got it. And then you're going to give me some tips, right, on some good stuff. Whatever you need. In. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Um, so VC is a hit industry, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of these firms, they'll make 10 investments, seven will fail, two will be okay, and one will pay for the rest, mm -hmm. right? And so in a hit and miss industry, the founders, right, the, the founders of the investment carry in an inordinate weight mm -hmm. in terms of, of reputation and their ability to then get subsequent, subsequent investments for other mm -hmm. add-ons. Do you believe that minority founders, right, that minority founders carry a heavier load because they're not just representing their entity, but they're representing the community which they represent? I think so. You know, and, and for me, I, I use the parallel of how we look at the NFL and we look at African-American quarterbacks. Um, you know, a couple years ago, um, you had a couple quarterbacks, Demarcus Russell and Vince Young, that played in the National Football League and didn't have the type of careers that people projected them to have. And I felt that that kind of 
hurt some of the quarterbacks that were coming down the pipeline. You think of the scrutiny that um, Cam Newton has to face right now. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say that he's crying or he's on the sideline pouting, uh, but he's showing passion just like Tom Brady is showing passion, passion when he's yelling or, or, or cussing out somebody. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think sometimes as uh, African-American founders, there's a heavy, uh, heavy burden uh, just to succeed and, su and to succeed at a high level because, you know, you're carrying the weight of, of everybody that's coming after you. Uh, you know, in, in the National Football League, we know when we hit free agency, uh, we always worried about a guy taking a bad deal. So if, I, if I'm coming up from free agency here in a couple of months, which I'm not, thank God. Um, we got three years, right? I still got some time okay. before, I, before I come to it. But if a guy takes a bad deal, that impacts my money. So from, you know, the sense of African-American founders, sometimes if, if a founder, you know, makes a wrong step, makes a wrong move, that impacts the, the entire trajectory of the founders that may be coming down the pipeline later on. So is there, what, what resources are there? for, in this case, African-American founders. Mm -hmm. you, know, it's not a, you know, unfortunately, it's not yeah. a big group, right? Yeah. And so, so that they have that support, mm -hmm. given that they're, you know, they may be carrying extra weight and they have a folks, folks who've done it or to mm -hmm. look to in addition to their funders, mm -hmm. right? Because the funders, they help, but they're funders, right? They're funders. But you know, I think one of the, the things is, how do we have African-Americans in places of influence? So whether they're institutional investors, uh, whether they're venture capital firms themselves. Uh, I know you have a, a, a firm here in, um, in Harlem, uh, Harlem Capital. Uh, that's starting to create their own type of entity um, where you have an, a, a, a black-led firm being able to invest in companies, backstage capital um, out, on, out on the West Coast. And then you also have a number of different entities, both uh, nonprofit and for-profit for entities that are trying to find ways to, to really, um, I guess, curate a better pipeline of how to get these founders into the right spots. And sometimes, you know, right now it's still fragmented. I mean, you think about the, v, the, the VC ecosystem in itself. You have New York, which is its own little ecosystem, and you have the Valley. You know, there's certain things that work in the Valley that don't work in New York. And now you've got these other um, ecosystems that are starting to butt up. You have Austin that's starting mm -hmm. to do a little, little something. You have uh, Atlanta that's starting to do a little something. You have the Midwest and Chicago and, and Ohio, and those guys starting to do a little something. So there's many different ecosystems that are around just in the VC community. And then you think about uh, how that pipeline trickles down and, and the, the most marginalized founders at the, at the bottom of the pipeline, it's hard to find those resources. But there are people that are starting to do those things um, across the country that are helping, um, you know, kind of bridge the gap for, for African-American founders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, I would, I would, it's good to hear that there's some sort of a support, mm -hmm. right? It is. In terms of, otherwise, it it's, it's, a lo you know, it's lonely to found a company. It may it be is. even lonelier if you don't have well, a network. Well, and then you have, you have people along the way, along the entire pipeline. So you have, uh, I know you got Precursor Ventures and Charles Hudson, uh, who's at the seed stage, that's doing a great job of, uh, over in the, in the valley uh, that are helping fund, uh, fund companies from a diverse standpoint. You have um, uh, Females Founders Fund here in New York. Uh, that has done a great job of just being extremely inclusive and providing opportunity for women of all color. Um, so there are some entities out there. I think, you know, what I consider myself a founder. I don't know what I'm a found yet, but I'm going to found something. <laughs> um, but at, at some point, you know, you have to understand where those people are and find ways to connect with them. And once you connect with them, follow up. Uh, I think as a society, we don't do a great job of following up with people. Um, mm -hmm. And that's whether you black, brown, blue, or green. Mm -hmm. One of the things, um, as you were talking about how you got in the investing area with John, Don with the relationship with John Donovan and mm -hmm. some others, it sounds like you've been very intentional and deliberate in uh, looking for mentors, right, and and mentoring people as well. I'd love to like unpack that a little yep, bit, understand sure. like how you you know how you started mm -hmm. as a young you know as a, as a young man, mm -hmm. you know, trying to find identifying the mentors, some of the folks who played. Yep. Uh, an important role in your development and, and what you look for in a mentor and, yep. and you know, maybe then flip it and talk about the folks who you mentor. Perfect. So, you know, for me, I always start with my dad. My dad was my number one mentor. Uh, even to this day, my dad still gets up at 3.45 in the morning, goes and works uh, at his automotive shop. He's been doing that all his life. Uh, didn't graduate uh, from high school, got an eighth grade education. For me, that's the number one mentor. He showed me not only how to work hard, but also how to be a family man. Um, he uh, been married for I'm 28. He's uh, been married for 29 years, so um, he's been married for a long time. It's, for me, that's the number one mentor. Um, so for me, when I look for mentors, it's what have you been able to accomplish that's so far from me right now? Like I have to actually run and try to find a way to catch you. Um, and for me, I've had people like um, uh, John Donovan, like I mentioned earlier, uh, David Huntley, who's also at AT&T. He was the first African American. Uh, student body president at SMU, and now he's the uh, uh, chief 
compliance officer at AT&T. Um, and for me, it was one of those people that have accomplished what I tried to accomplish in, in, in college and then went into the corporate workforce and has com completely just trailblazed his own trail. He's made his own trail, literally, and he's done it in the, in the, in the most gracious way. Um, and for me, it's, it's one of those things. I want to find somebody that's done something that I haven't been able to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, I play football, but at some point, football is going to end. So who are these people in other sectors and other industries and, and experts in their field that can help me along the way as I continue to have questions um, and need guidance on, on places or things that I may be pursuing at the time? And do you, do you look after, when you think about a mentor, do you look more for specific expertise? Mm -hmm. And you'll have multiple mentors, each with specific ex areas of expertise, or more for like a single, more you know, more comprehensive relationship that you talk about a lot of different stuff. So I have relationships where they're very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. I can talk about a number of different things. Uh, uh, I have a good friend, um, Sherwin Pryor, who is over at uh, uh, General Motors Ventures. Um, has done a great job in the automotive space. You know, I, I told you my dad grew up working on cars. I love cars. Um, but he knows the automotive space way better than I do. He does that 24-7. I play football 24-7, so that's what he does. Um, I have uh, uh, people who are in the healthcare space um, that know that space extremely well. Uh, I have people in drone space who know that space extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much every industry that I like, whether it be agriculture technology. You know, last just two weekends ago, uh, I went to a place called 44 Farms down in Cameron, Texas. I have no knowledge of how to run a corporate farming system. I just don't. So I went to where uh, they're the number one Angus producing cattle ranch in, uh, in Texas, number three in the nation. So I'm going to go over there and learn about how you do it. Um, now, I'm not going to run a cattle ranch to that magnitude, but I'm going to have my little, my, little, you know, my, little, my little herd over here at some point. <laughs> you know, they got uh, 25 miles of fencing. Now, I'm not going to have that many miles of fencing, but I'm going to have a little fencing down in my hometown. So it's learning from others in their particular industries and pulling from it. And the thing is, everybody has different perspectives, and it's a very diverse group of, of individuals, people from here in America. I have a, actually was on, a, on the phone with a friend from Israel. Um, I went to Australia this year. When I go to travel, I try to find the best business people in that particular location. Mm -hmm. So I went to Australia. I met with Blackbird Ventures, uh, which is a, a number, the number one VC in Australia. Uh, I met with a, a drone company, a top drone company out of uh, Australia. Um, and then I met with a drone advisor while I was in Australia. And then met with, you have the Emmys here in America. And I don't know, I can't remember what they call them over there, but I met with the managing director of the, the Emmys for Australia. Um, just to, to, to diversify my network and continue to diversify the type of people that I have access to. Um, so it's, it's, for me, it's, it's understanding what I need and then being able to find the people you know, that are most important. Then when it comes to people that I like to mentor, um, it's young people that you know, may not have a father in their home. You know, I had, you know, both the father and the mother had a two-parent two household. So uh, Dalian Huff uh, is a guy down in, in Texas. He's actually, he's actually is at a, one of the schools that I adopted, the Barack Obama Male Leadership Academy uh, down in Dallas. Um, his, his father was incarcerated at the time and, and had a chance to be that father figure while um, he was, he was um, incarcerated. And then when he came out, I kind of backed out the way and let his father take on that role, but was there for him. Uh, Cortland. Uh, Man, he plays the drums at my, at my, at my uh, college church, um, mentor him. Um, so it's, and then, you know, coming from where I come from, uh, it's a small town, so anytime any child is going through anything, my mother sends me their number and says, hey, you need to call this boy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I call him, and, um, you know, I, and I've called people from all walks of life, you know, uh, hey, uh, this young man just broke his femur. He would love some encouragement. Hey, this guy, he's, 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 he's has the opportunity to go to college, but right now he's going through some things and, you know, he has a girl in his life and he doesn't know how to manage it. You know, so it's, it's being uh, mentored and then also bringing it back down um, and being able to mentor somebody else. And then for me, you know, I've, I've got great people in my life. You know, Troy Vincent um, is here right now and he's been one of those people who's been there um, through some of the, the challenges that, you know, as an NFL that we've had this year um, and being able to bounce ideas and bounce topics off of. So it's, it's being able to say that you don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know everything. I don't know. I know how to play football. I know how to play football really good. Um, outside of playing football, there are some things that I need help with. And for me, it's being okay with saying I don't know and reaching out to others um, who are well more experienced than you are and experts in those particular fields and picking their brain and picking um, up on some of the things that they learned on their journey. Tell you what, as you're talking about your mom and dad, I'd love to have them up here. <laughs> they, sound, they, sound like, they sound like really solid people. Oh, uh, They were very people. stern. 
Uh, well, that's why you turned out so well, probably. Um, um, the, uh, you know, when you're in the locker room or in other you know, circles with, with, with your, your fellow professional football players, mm -hmm. obviously you have a vision of post, you know, post, post, you know, the day the football is no longer what you want to do every day. Mm -hmm. um, how many of them are thinking that way? And I guess it depends on where in their career they are. Cool. But I mean, is that something that, that you encourage them to, to take an active role? Or mm -hmm. are a lot of them already you know, thinking about post-retirement You know, it's, it's, some, it's some guys that are doing a great job. You know, uh, I don't know if any of you all follow, follow Buster Screen, who's here in the area. Uh, he started his own like workout studio here in New York and has people come and, 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 and check things out. And then guys are doing a great job of just follow your passions. Whatever your passion is, follow that and then allow you know, the business to kind of flow from there. And there's been a number of guys across the National Football League that have played now and you know, have, have already left the game, and they did a great job of preparing themselves to be able to transition. Uh, John Urschel is a good friend of mine, a mathematician who's at MIT right now. Uh, Myron Rowe, um, who was a Rowe Scholar, uh, played in the National Football League for a little bit. Guys that you know, I consider my inspiration because they did it uh, way better than I did. You know, I'm not a mathematician, but John Urschel is, is phenomenal at it. Uh, I can't work on the brain, but uh, Myron Rowe has, has pretty much solidified that he is the go-to. Once he finishes, I mean, if anything happened with my head, he, I'm, I'm going to Myron Rowe to, to take care of me. <laughs> Uh, but those guys, you know, it's been a number of guys throughout the National Football League that have done a great job of, of preparing themselves because at the end of the day, you know, um, it's, a, it's a two to three year, you know, that's the average. Two to three years is, is, is kind of the average for the lifetime of a, of a football athlete. And if you make it past that, you, uh, you cook them with gas, as, as Coach Tomlin used to say. And does the NFLPA, which I know you've been mm -hmm. super active in, help uh, professional athletes mm -hmm. kind of, kind of, kind of think about the, you know, the post-retirement They do a good job. You, and we have two great resources. We have the NFL and we have the NFLPA mm -hmm. uh, that provides a number of different resources, externships, internships, shadowing opportunities. Um, you have transitions pro transition programs uh, with NFLPA and the trust uh, that they've established. Um, so both entities do a great job of providing the resources. But at the end of the day, it's ownership. And what are you going to do personally mm -hmm. to try to advance uh, your career? Got it. I have two more questions for you, mm -hmm. and then I want to open it up to the, the folks here. The first is, um, you know, we've, we've seen a little bit of volatility in the stock market the last <laughs> couple of days, right? Um, and, and so I'm not going to ask you for your opinions on the stock market. Don't right ask now, me. I, I have I think no None idea. of us know, right? <laughs> no but but if, if we zoom out a little bit and just mm -hmm. talk about, you know, most of the folks in the audience here are folks in their 20s and 30s and really, you know, thinking about their financial futures. Mm -hmm. And so the topic, one of the topics for this chat was about investment management and money management. What are some of the, like just the core beliefs and core principles that you adhere to when you're thinking about uh, managing your own portfolio? Living below my means. You know, I think that's the number These one. These folks live in Manhattan. I, I, <laughs> still. I mean, I live, in, I live in yeah. New Jersey, and uh -huh. it's expensive out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I purposely still have my 96 Chevy Tahoe that my dad made me work on that I still drive around today. And it was on flat this morning, uh, but uh, it, it's, it, 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 uh, it can move, I put it that way. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, just continue to live below your means, uh -huh. you know, uh, whether you're an athlete, whether you're uh, somebody in the workforce right now, whether you're LinkedIn, you know, what have you. Um, I think it's, number one, living below your means. And then for me, you know, as you're starting to develop and build wealth, I, I think the most important thing is just to save your money. Uh, you know, have a budget. I think budgeting is something that people don't, think about enough and then they're not willing to hold themselves accountable to that budget. If your budget is 5000 a month, make sure you come in at 3500 You know, because uh, that means you got 1500 for the next month, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to save a little bit more for the next month and then you kind of grow from there. Uh, but, you know, for me, when I got my first check uh, in the National Football League, my first check was more than my mom and dad made in one year. Literally, my first check. And I was, mind you, I was a seven-round pick. So I didn't get no uh, multi-million dollar signing bonus. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my signing bonus was like 45000 at the time. Um, and for me, that was more than my parents made in the entire year, together, wow. as a household. Um, so for me, even now, you know, when I have to, to pay these cell phone bills, I got a family now, I got to pay these cell phone bills, I kind of cringe a little bit because that's a lot of money. Uh, but it's about sticking to that budget and then, and then uh, rolling from there. Got it. And so last question. Yep. I've been on your LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. Got a great profile. 
Uh, everybody here is uh, their day job is making LinkedIn, you know, help our members. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you use LinkedIn? What are the things that you do on it? I have fun on LinkedIn. <laughs> I have a lot of fun on LinkedIn. You know, um, LinkedIn has been, and you have all these different platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, you have Instagram, you have Snapchat, you have Facebook, and you have Twitter. But of those platforms, can you connect with some of the best professionals in the world? And that's what LinkedIn does. And as an athlete, some people don't think that, you know, you're really about that life and you're really about kind of growing your brand and growing your, pro your professional brand and, and, and becoming a better, better businessman. And I've been able to do that on LinkedIn, whereas I wasn't able to do that on the other platforms. So for mm -hmm. me, I've really taken it and just had a lot of fun with it. You know, speak about some of the things that I have uh, on the business fronts, highlight some of the, the, the work that I'm doing, um, whether it's with the NFLPA or with the foundations or with uh, the hunger space or STEM space, and be able to connect with professionals and some of the best in their particular sector, um, you know, as I've continued to build out that, build out that profile. So I love LinkedIn, love everything about it. Well, well, good. I think LinkedIn loves you, Kelvin. Okay? I, just, I, can t I can tell you every now, but we're so glad that it's, it's, you know, that's the intent. That's what we're here to do for, uh, for business people like you. Um, so what I'd like to do, actually, I want to do two things. The first is I want to, who do I talk to about become the kicker job? Because <laughs> like, this thing, LinkedIn thing doesn't work out. I, you know, um, like you know how, well, the, the thing is I see a lot of gray hair, no pun intended. But um, <laughs> He's got good eyes, too. <laughs> but, but your clock may have ran out a long time ago. <laughs> As long as, my, as long as my wife doesn't well, say that, I, you know, I like, we're in good shape, man. <laughs> I like to be transparent. I like to tell the truth. That, so. I got it. I, I, I got it. We still love you at LinkedIn. Here at <laughs> okay. We'd love to take questions from the audience. Uh, and, uh, and if we have it on the stream as well, I think we can take those as well. But, uh, you know, not every day that we have uh, an athlete, investor, philanthropist, and really active mentor uh, here. So well, we just, where's the mics? We have a mic right there. People can come right up to it there. It's a long walk. Come on over. Here you go. It's right, right there. Right in front of my face. I'm sorry. Um, hi, uh, my name is B. Awe, and actually, I'm a advisor and a founding team member, team member of HBCU VC, which is historically black colleges and universities, the venture capital. And our mission is to, you know, bring awareness of the VC space to black college students. Um, but that's not my question. My question is, I'm wondering if you ascribe to this idea that um, there, there's something, uh, multiple things I see all the time when black or minority founders are interacting with VCs. The first thing is that they need to have a technical founder, right? So somebody in that pair needs to be technical. The second thing is, particularly with women founders who are stepping up to the plate there, they need a male founder, right? Because there's no validity in only being a female founder, right? And so wondering when you're making investments, are those the things that you kind of look for or kind of ascribe to? Or are you, are you working actively to kind of work against that? For me, I'm working against it. And I know HBCU VC, you have a great board, <laughs> uh, uh, K-Port Capital, mm -hmm. um, Charles 500 Sussex, startups. 500 startups, yeah. uh, Kanye, uh, that used to be over at Collaborative Fund. You have done a great job. But for me, I, I like to look at Again, I like to pull the curtain back and, and look for things outside of what the traditional VC looks for. Um, and I know the stereotype. I got a wife. I can't wait for my wife to start a company because she's a phenomenal woman. And I can't wait for it. She's a queen, my black queen. Uh, I love her. Shout out to my wife. She should be watching, but she got two kids at home. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I can't wait for her to start a company because I know she's going to be successful. Um, and for me, I don't aspire or, or try to follow the traditional route of, Hey, if you're not from, if you're from Stanford or you're from MIT or you're from Yale, you have a better shot at running uh, a particular startup. So for me, I try to look outside of that and find ways and actually look for startups that have female founders. Uh, uh, Angel Rich is a, is a founder that I've really become really close with. Is doing something around financial literacy. Uh, love what she's doing. It's a guy by the name of Harold Hughes, um, who's not a super technical founder, uh, who's running a company called Bandwagon that's actually at an accelerator down in Austin. So for me, I try to look outside of what the traditional VCs look for um, and really find ways to help uh, people that look like myself. Because uh, for me, I didn't always have uh, the greatest opportunity. Uh, I didn't have everybody looking at me. I wasn't 6'7", 330. Uh, I'm 6'2", and 7'8", and uh, 297. So <laughs> I had to look at things a little differently. <laughs> I hope that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. How you doing? I'm uh, Keith Bernard, programmatic sales lead for North America here at LinkedIn. Thank you, first of all, for coming and visiting with us today. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two questions for you. The second one's really short, but first one's simple. Um, so you're a philanthropist, mentor, 
and an athlete, of those, which one is the most important to you? Let me, and, can I answer that real quick? Yeah. Athlete, because that pays all the bills. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. None, none, of this, none of this other stuff can happen unless I do my day job really good. I hear that. So priorities. Got yep. it. Okay. It's levels. Uh, and then the second thing is, uh, what are you wearing to the Black Panther uh, movie when it comes out? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it comes out uh, next week. Um, my anniversary is tomorrow. Um, that'll be five years of being married. And then next week it comes out, right? So I'm going to be in Arizona. Uh, this is pretty much the best that y'all will see. Uh, but when I'm, when I'm not in front of a camera or speaking, I got some sweats on and uh, some slides on, some loafers, uh, and a, a long sleeve black shirt. Uh, I look like a homeless guy when, I, when, I'm, when I'm not playing football. And I'm going to go, and I'm going to pick up a pack of M&M's. I love peanut M&M's. And me and my wife are going to have somebody watch the kids, and we're going to go enjoy the movie. How are you doing, Kelvin? How are you uh, doing? Harold Valston, search and staffing relationship manager here at LinkedIn. So one of the questions I have is, um, you know, traditionally in the NFL or any one of the sports, athletes retire five years later, they consider, they're said to be bankrupt, broke, or destitute to some degree. What have you seen in your sport, in the NFL, that they're doing to mitigate that a bit? And are you trying to help some of the younger guys that come up after you to mitigate that situation as well? I think the first and foremost thing, you have to work on yourself. You know, the Bible talks about charity starts at home and then spreads abroad. So for me, it's how do I make sure that I'm not a statistic first and foremost? So handle that first. And then who in my sphere of athletes that I feel that I can talk to, because every athlete you can't talk to, some guys are going to do what they want to anyways, but who in my sphere can I talk to that I can help aid them along the way? Um, and I've been able to do that in college uh, while I was at SMU and now. You know, I've done that with every team that I've been a part of. And then for me, it's, it's bringing somebody along for the ride. If I, if I got some good things going on in my life, how can I find ways to, to bring other people along with me, whether it be, you know, somebody that played in Pittsburgh or somebody that played in Jacksonville or anybody across the National Football League. And not, even, not just football, but just in life. You know, uh, I got a, my best friend. He grew up, you know, playing football together. Now he's working in the healthcare field. I had a healthcare deal come across the table. I'm like, hey, do you want some of this? What do you know about this space? You know, he may not have a capital right now, but, he, you know, just allowing him to see something like this that's in his space that he sees every day, um, for me, that's what's most important. You know, as I move forward and as we as a collective body in the National Football League move forward is how do we help those and make sure that those who have fallen on the wayside have resources and, and make sure, you know, we also have to have some preventative measures to make sure um, guys utilize the resources. We talked about the NFL and the NFLPA has a number of different resources, but at the end of the day, guys have to actually activate them and use them because they're there and they're free. You know, they, the NFL and the NFLPA will pay for you to go to college and reimburse you, but it's still so much money that's left behind because some guys don't, don't use it. So at the end of the day, it's a personal decision. If you're willing to make that personal decision and move your life forward, the resources not only in the NFL, but I think across corporate America and across the world that can help you move your idea or make sure you don't become a statistic. But first and foremost, I have to make sure that I'm not a statistic and then be able to leverage my network to make sure that I can bring others along for the ride. I can appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Terry Opong, how's everyone doing? I just wanted to pretty much just uh, in front of everyone talk about how Kelvin and I met. I think you reached out to me on LinkedIn, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So just to really, you know, and then from there we've, we've, we've connected with a lot of people and I really think what you're doing is really amazing. My question is to get a bit deeper into the question I was just asked because I'm a former financial advisor. I know a lot of resources are there. Specifically to the players, what, what do you find is the biggest challenge, right, beyond what we've talked about? Because coming from my space, I was a financial advisor for six years. So they are aware, but I also feel as though personally, a lot of the players I did get referred to, it was the agents sometimes that were pretty much trying to not let them work with certain advisors based on the compensation structure. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, are you seeing that? Is that, is that factual? Is that just all really just uh, hearsay? Because that's something that we personally dealt with as advisors. I think there's some, some validity to that. Um, agents get a kickback with certain uh, financial advisors that they go with. Um, I think that's something that, that happens all the time. But at the end of the day, you know, I had a, I had a guy by the name of um, Eugene Parker. Uh, he was a great... Um, great agent, 
Uh, he was my agent. That was the agent I went through. Was he was an African-American out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay. And the first thing he taught me was be a pro. If you're going to be a pro, you also got to be a CEO. Mm. So as an athlete, the minute that you say, I mean, I think this can go for anybody, but the minute that you say, um, I'm in the National Football League, and the minute you get drafted, you're your own CEO. Mm -hmm. So you got to find a way to build your team and build your moat around you. So you got to find your own legal counsel. You got to find your own financial advisor. I don't find a financial advisor already. And it, I mean, it's just, I like firing people. I mean, if you don't do your job, I just fire you. I mean, it ain't no big deal. Because in the National Football League, if you don't do your job, you get fired. You know what I'm saying? So I think athletes have to take that role on being an active CEO as an athlete. And if you can do that, then you are able to dictate the terms of what people are doing around you, whether it's your agent, whether it's your massage therapist, whether it's your acupuncturist. You know, you got to build that moat around you, and you get to dictate it. And I think some guys get into this thing where, well, that's my financial advisor, give it to him, and forget about it. But if you have an active role, I mean my financial advisor multiple times a year, you're going to fly to me wherever I'm at. If I'm in Arizona, you're flying to me. If I'm in New York, you're flying to me. And you have to take that active role, and I think we as athletes sometimes don't take that active role in our life. And when we do that, sometimes we end up in, you know, uncompromising positions. Definitely. And shameless plug, if anyone needs an outfit for Black Panther, I got some pants for you. <laughs> Hi. Um, you mentioned a few things earlier in terms of money management and some tips. Um, and I think that while it is pretty situational, I think on everyone's, based on everyone's circumstances, what would you say is your number one thing to not do in order to better manage your money and to kind of think long term? And um, whether it's investing or uh, budgeting or saving, you mentioned stick to your budget, you mentioned live below your means, um, which are great tips. And I just wanted to know what was your, um, if you had a tip or your number one tip for what not to do. And that's just my first question. So from an athlete standpoint, the number one thing that I was told not to do is don't buy any jewelry. That's what guys buy a lot of jewelry, you know, 50, 100, 150, thousand um, for a piece of jewelry. So that's not to do. So I think that for me, the, the things that as you're moving forward in, um, you know, in the workforce, the things not to do is not to just be stupid. Sometimes it's, it's very simple. I think when you're managing money, if you get so much in, you need to save so much to be able to live off on and be able to prepare uh, for the future. Um, and that can be taken into to many different lights. But I think as far as what not to do is just don't be reckless. And some people are so reckless with money, you know, especially in this day and time. You know, you want to hang with the Joneses. Um, you want to do, you want to wear Gucci's. You want to wear red bottoms. You know, I've, I've, I don't own a pair, so I don't know what they look like. I just know, I hear it in the locker room, so I'm just telling you what I hear in the locker room. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, don't go and try to be something that you're not. You know, if you're a country bumpkin like I am, you're a country bumpkin. You wear two pair of jeans. I still got two pair of jeans. I grew up on two pair of jeans. I still got two pair of jeans. Now, I wash them a lot, but I still got two pair of jeans. You know, and it's like, just stick to who you are. Don't be afraid to be who you are. Um, and I think in this society, especially with how social media is, and you see this over here, you see this over here, you want to be this other person, but it costs to be the boss. And sometimes, you know, we as a people try to be something that we're not. Just be who you are. Again, live below your means and just try not to be reckless. I hope that helps. I know that wasn't like a very practical or tactical answer, but it's, for me, it's, it's, very, it's a very logical answer. I'm telling my wife no more jewelry. I know. That was very <laughs> practical for me. Well, see, the thing is, you know, when married people, it's happy wife, happy life, so she won't, you know, something, you yeah. might as well make it happen. God. I will not go and buy any $150,000 chains. Thank you. <laughs> um, and my second question really quickly was, um, you mentioned metrics earlier, and whether it's at work or my personal life, I'm all about metrics all day, every day. That determines where we open up a new location or what we, what products we start pushing, or you know, so on and so forth. And so, with all of the, you know, you mentioned six, um, I guess, is your sort of projected number of uh, investments for 2018. Whether you're passionate about something or not, let's be honest. Um, I think it needs to be profitable on some level oh, or at least pay for itself, yes. if, if nothing more. What, have you ever kind of done some research and dived in, uh, dive in, uh, kind of jumped into something that you thought you were going to invest in and then pulled back? What is it that deters you from, from, from 
involving yourself in something, whether or not you're super passionate about it, just because the, you know, from a, from a monetary standpoint, maybe yep. it's not the yep, smartest. Sure. And I can speak to something that just happened recently. Um, you know, everybody's in the crypto space right now. Everybody, that's all everybody talk about all day, every day long, all day long. And they had this, uh, they got this app called Tele Telegram. I think that's the name of the app, Telegram, yeah. where you can be able to message people about the different crypto space. And I had an opportunity to um, invest in the ICO. And the ICO at that point in time was, um, I think it was one point, valued at $1.6 billion. And I already had some reserves, but I was going in with some people who knew the space a lot better than I did. I started to lean on my network. I started asking more questions around the space. And I was gung-ho with putting 5000 in. I start really small. I don't start with no six-figure check. Um, I was just going to put 5000 in just to you know, um, kind of go from there and see how it grows. And um, my guy that I had, you know, that, that I was going in with, um, his round got pushed out completely, and he was writing a seven-figure check. And they bumped the minimum up to like five million. And when they did that, the valuation went to like five, uh, 3.5 billion. And I'm like, this is reckless. This is it's stupid. There's no way that this ICO is going to be valued at 3.5 billion. So when I saw that, I'm like, well, I'm going to take my $5,000 check, and I'm going to go on back home and sit down and be perfectly fine with myself. So there's been times where I've been pretty close to the edge, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to make this investment. And then I pull back when I realize that this is really not something that I need to do at this point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Ty Heath, and I do product education for LinkedIn Marketing Solutions, and I'm also the president of our Black Inclusion Group, so we're thrilled to have you here. Mm -hmm. Those are some really practical tips. I'm like looking where I can scale back on shopping. <laughs> uh, so question, you're talking about wealth, and I want to talk about wealth creation. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is a topic of conversation is how, does we, how do we get more people of color into leadership roles? So when you start looking at the, at the ownership level mm -hmm of the NFL, what are some of the conversations that you are hearing among the players and the owners about increasing the amount of people of color in ownership positions? And I think that's something that businesses are also thinking about. How do we do that? You know, that's something that uh, players in the locker room talk about quite a bit. Um, we understand it. Uh, we get it. Uh, we understand that 70% uh, of the, the National Football League is dominated by African American men. Uh, we understand that um, 31 of the 32 owners are from a Caucasian descent. So mm -hmm. only 1%, well, one person is from minority descent, which is a Jacksonville a Jaguars owner. Mm -hmm. I mean, we understand that. Um, and I think guys, you know, Russell Okung is a good friend of mine. He's already talked about owning a team one day, uh, which I, I hope and pray that he's able to do that. But it's something that we talk about quite a bit. Now, how we get it done, mm -hmm. um, this is an opportunity to get it done in the venture space. You know, you understand that you have some big wins that can provide those billions in your bank account where mm -hmm. you can be able to right. have a ownership, a true ownership stake mm -hmm. in, in some of these businesses. But for me, I take it a step further, um, is what are ways in which we as athletes, you know, because right now the, the whole conversation is around data. Who owns the data? Who owns the, sensor, the sensories that are on our body? Who owns these different things? And it comes to a point where we as athletes need to find a way to own everything that touches right. us. And if we can own everything that touches us, we're winning. You know, we may not be able to own, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the New York Jets. You know, uh, Woody got that long money. You know, <laughs> P&G been in the game for a long time. You know, we can't, yeah. you know, you know it's, it's, it's billionaires and it's millionaires. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to take some time. But what are other ways in which we could uh, find a way to leverage our expertise and our knowledge and our network to find ways to own other things that impact us on a daily daily basis. Great, thank you so much. No problem. We got two gentlemen, one, one more question, one more question. yes. John, you got the last I question. I bring it home. Uh, John Furnch, I met earlier, I lead the uh, global account sales team here in New York. Um, first of all, thank you for bringing your authentic, genuine self to us. It's a gift, we appreciate it. Um, I wanna talk about inspirational leadership for a moment. You've been in a number of different locker rooms, had a number of different coaches. Mm -hmm. Some of them have high football IQ, mm -hmm. some have high people EQ. Mm -hmm. Share with us you know, what makes an inspirational leader to you mm -hmm. and maybe one of the top inspirational coaches that you've had in that locker room. So what it means to be an inspirational leader, I think for me is um, having that emotional intelligence to be able to push the right button when you need to. 
Um, and I've been around uh, two coaches that have done a phenomenal job of doing that. Uh, Mike Tomlin uh, down in Pittsburgh just knows which buttons to push uh, when, he, when you need to. Um, for me, uh, I hate it, but I loved it when he would say, you know, at the time it was myself who was a seven-round pick and an undrafted guy by the name of Ramon Foster who was on the left side. And on the right side, you had Marcus Gilbert, second-round pick, um, David Castro, first-round pick, and Marquise Pouncey, which is the first-round pick. And he would say, hey, this is my pedigree side, and this is my non-pedigree side. <laughs> and for me, that would run me hot, but he knew <laughs> how to get certain reactions out of me. Um, and that pushed me. That, that, that left that chip on my shoulder even after I became a starter to realize that that was the stigma that was put on me when I came into the National Football League. This is the non-pedigree side, and this is the, the pedigree side. And then I look at guys, uh, what my current coach uh, and Coach Bowles, um, he's a quiet, very, very quiet man, but knows what to say and when to say it. Um, sometimes we measure leaders by how much they talk, what they're saying, how much rah-rah and, and, and verbata they have with, with how they coach. But sometimes it's being uh, okay with being quiet, and it's okay with just walking and walking, talking to talk. And he's done that uh, throughout my tenure here um, with New York, and I don't think he's ever going to change. He's been, from what I've heard, he's been the same guy he was when he was back um, in Washington. But I think a lot of people look at coaches and, and look for them for most of the inf inspira inspiration. But I think a lot of, of the inspirational leaders are really in the locker room. And I've been around a number of them. Uh, Troy Palomalu, who was in uh, Pittsburgh, just an inspirational guy, but didn't really talk a lot. Um, for me, probably the, 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 my favorite most favorite player that I've ever played with is a guy by the name of Heath Miller, uh, who was a tight end for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who, if you're not from Pittsburgh, you really wouldn't know him. Uh, but you, if you're in Pittsburgh, you know, when he catches the ball, when he caught a ball, you would hear, he. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not many people that know him, but he was probably one of the most inspirational people um, that I ever played with. And he didn't talk a lot, you know. Um, but then we got a guy by the name of Demario Davis uh, here in, in New York. And man, he brings, uh, you might as well you know, have an organ behind him, man, because uh, he brings the, brings the heat on Sundays. But he's one of those guys that he walks in and he talks it. And I think as inspirational leaders, you have to be able to not only talk it, but you got to walk the walk as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, Kelvin, um, I think you've earned the title today of an inspirational leader for us. And so, uh, to John's point, thank you so much for sharing yes, your story, your advice. Um, it's a privilege to, to get to. Uh, to chat with you and learn from your journey. Cool. It, and, uh, and I'll forget the gray hair remark completely. <laughs> right? And, and I wish that you will have gray hair one day. Because <laughs> that means you'll keep hair. Yeah, um, true. But thanks so much. And thanks to the Black Inclusion Group again for sponsoring this and for the rest of the LinkedIn family. And so um, we're going to end the formal part of the program. But we do have, I believe we have, you know, this being LinkedIn, I think we have some, uh, some snacks and nibbles. Are they over here on the right side? Uh, on the left side. Okay. So uh, if you were too shy to ask a question, you're going to hang out for a little while? I'll be here. Great. Maybe you can get a chance to, uh, to meet Kelvin and, uh, and ask your question then. So thanks again. Thank you, man. That was fun.